Almighty God, we thank you very much for the privilege we have to come here. Thank you for this conference, leading us who are teaching children and young people. And young people and children, they are very precious and important to your sight. And it's one of the greatest ministries we can ever have to be privileged to teach, to lead, to help, to support, to encourage our children and young people. We are praying that this great privilege you have given every one of us will never lose it in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for myself. I pray that the vision to reach the youth and the children I'll never lose it in Jesus' name. I pray for all our leaders. I pray for all our workers. I pray for the whole church. There is great vision. To reach the children of the world will never lose the vision in Jesus' name. And these young people whom you are using mightily, in this their young age, the vision you have planted in their hearts now, the commitment and the sacrifice they have now until they grow older and they become real leaders and heroes in the kingdom of God, they'll never lose the vision in Jesus' name. This day, open our eyes that we may see what you want us to see and why you brought us here and what you want to accomplish in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. In Psalm 1, 1, 9, 1, 19. I'm reading to you from verse 18. Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Here we find prayer. And here we find somebody, he wasn't blind in the physical. He wasn't unintelligent, ignorant in the academic. He wasn't a lowly fellow that didn't know anything, and yet he knew. With your normal brain, with your natural self, and with the education that you have received, and with your physical eyesight, and with everything you have in the natural, in the physical, you can only see just so much limited thing. That's why he said, I can read and I can see the law of God. I can see the hand of God in the universe. I can see everything around me. But if I am going to see the hidden wonders, if I am going to see the wondrous things out of thy law. See, people don't see that there's any wonder in the law. All they see in the law is that there is legalism. And that there is difficulty. And there is a hurdle. They think they see restraint. They see restriction. They don't see wonderful things in the law. They see that law, they think that law is a, def is a difficult thing and is to guard you, is to set a territory for you in the natural, with your mind, with your brain. You will not see the wonders in the law of God. That's why the psalmist prayed, he said, Lord, open my eyes. Do it yourself. Don't even send an angel to do it. Open thou mine eyes that i may behold not only to see that i may behold it's like taking a microscope and then looking at it intently and looking at it seriously and looking at it in every detail and looking at it and seeing what almighty god what he had in mind when he put that law when he put it there and then he said, do it yourself, that I, others may not see. You know, there are some kinds of prayer. You have to pray for yourself first. That I may behold. You know, there are people that come to conferences like this. And all their mind is, how I wish that brother A, sister B, whom I brought to this place will see and will behold. They don't pray for themselves. 
Do you know there are some people that they think, I've been reading this thing now for five years. I've been reading it now for ten years. You think there's anything for me to see again? This is not my first time of coming. I came before. I was in a conference like this before. And I've even organized a conference like this before myself in my state. What do you think I can see again? Nothing. But this man said, you know, this is a man that knew the Lord from when he was very young. He has seen the power of God. He has seen the wonders of God. He had the words of God. He had spiritual experiences. And yet he said, here is a new day. Here is a new opportunity. Here is a new situation. And God is so big. And God is so great in majesty and honor and glory. And God is so infinite. And, so, and God is so high and God is so deep that no matter how many years you have attended conferences, no matter how many years you have been following the Lord, no matter how many times you have heard his word and read his word, there is still something that you have not seen yet. There is still something that you don't know yet. There is still something you have not been able to get into the depths of that thing. That's why he said, here I come. And if there is any prayer I am praying, it is that you, almighty God, will open my eyes so that I, myself, he was a king. And as a king, elevated, exalted high. He must have seen he must have known greater things than everybody in the whole nation. That man, as a prince, as a king, as the one specially favored by the Lord, he had seen very much with the Lord. He had seen very much in power. He had seen very much in victory. He had seen very much in his nation. He had, he had seen very much in other nations. And yet, he said, there's still something I can see. Do you know there are people, if they are exalted, lifted high, as a leader, youth pastor, youth leader, youth minister, and, and they've seen a lot, they've read a lot, maybe some of them have even gone to university, they've studied education. And he studied some psychology with it, administration with it, and some philosophy with it. And they've read the Bible, and they've gone to some kind of theological seminary, and they've seen something already. Hey, do you know there are some people that when they come to a conference like this, they, uh, they just look at the rest of the people, they say, I hope these people can learn some, as for me, I just came here, I needed some time off. Because I've been, you know, busy here, I'm busy there, I'm busy. I just needed some time just to come here and just refresh myself. I don't think, uh, you know, I can discover anything new, any, anything, anything different. I know a lot already. There you are. You missed something here. A man exalted and lifted up. He said, as I come. And I present myself here. There is something yet to be known. There is something yet to behold. There is something yet to perceive. There is something yet to understand. There is something yet to see which I have not seen. That's why it said, Lord, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things when you come on when you come in here and you hear the word of god the law of god the statutes of god the scriptures of god what do you see what you see will depend on how much you allow almighty god to influence you to open your eyes if you allow satan To interact with you. To relate with you. When you read the word. You will not see anything good. You're going to, Satan is going to turn everything upside down. 
perverse. It's going to pervert what you read. And it will be like an inversion. And that thing passes through the pyramid of Satan. And what comes on the other side is inverted. If you allow, when you read the word of God, as you come to the conference here, if you allow your human mind to interpret to you and to influence you and to tell you what you are hearing, the thing is going to be blood. It's like when you see an image and you see that image and it's not very clear and there's a lot of shade around the letters because your eyesight is dim you will not see clearly and you will not understand what is said thus says the lord it's when you come in here and while you're coming from the hostel when you wake up in the morning or when you are coming after the afternoon break and you're saying lord i want my life to count I want to do something with this life. I don't want a wasted life that is just active, acting every day and not going anywhere. Merry go round. Merry go round. It's like that ant you see on the plate, moving around the edge of the plate in circles. And that ant can do that. A whole day without getting anywhere. I don't want my life to be like that. Therefore, that's why. Come. And while you're coming from your hostel or coming from anywhere, or somebody is coming here to preach the word, you forget every other thing and you say, I want to see wondrous things, wonderful things, glorious things beneficial things, profitable things out of your law. It's a prayer, I told you. It must be a prayer you pray fervently. You pray with faith. You need to pray this prayer frequently. It's a prayer that you are telling the Lord, oh, if you prayed it yesterday, you must pray today. If you made the prayer today, you must make that prayer tomorrow because Every day has a new revelation in the word of God to reveal unto you. If you prayed it in the last retreat, you must pray it in this conference. Because every conference, every retreat, every camp has something to reveal unto you which you didn't have before. You pray this prayer frequently. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. You pray it fervently. They shall go. And seek me and find me when they shall search for me with all their heart. If you pray it as if you are sleeping, if you pray it as if you are not serious about it, if you pray it as somebody as if somebody is putting words in your mouth to pray it, that's not prayer. If you pray it, you, just, you know, just to pray, just to pray, like a formula, it doesn't work. But when it's fervent, when there's some desire, some passion in it, and you say, Lord, I, I can't do without this supernatural operation for you to clear my eyesight, to remove the glaucoma in my spiritual sight, for you to remove the thing that is blocking my view spiritually. Lord, I'm serious about it. Intensive prayer. Open that my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. And I send you pray to a faith. Because when you ask God, if anyone lacks wisdom, lacks insight, lacks understanding, and he doesn't see wondrous things out of the law, if anybody lacks wisdom, insight, understanding, let him ask of God, but let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, tossed to and fro. Let not that man seek, he shall receive anything from the Lord. That means then ask. It shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. 
everyone that asketh receiveth he that seeketh findeth to him that knocketh it shall be open which man of you have been any child if the child shall ask bread will he for bread give him stone if he shall ask a fish will he for a fish give him a servant if you then being evil not to give good gifts to your children how much more shall your father which is in heaven give good thing? this is a good thing this is a good thing ask him that god will open your eyes and you'll behold one does things out of his law this is a good thing how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to them that ask him hey, this is greater than asking for healing asking for deliverance asking for this asking for material things Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of your love. Now, when God so opens our eyes, what do we see? Many, many things. I'll just give you three. Number one, the revelation of God's way. The revelation of God's way. Number two, righteousness through God's word. Righteousness through God's word. Number three, release to God's work. Release to God's work. When God opens our eyes, he makes us to behold wondrous things out of his law. In his law, there is wisdom. In his law, there is his way. In his law, there is his one, we have his wonders. In his law, we have his word. In his law, we have his work that he releases us to do. All that we're asking the Lord is, Lord, I am here. And I want you to open my eyes so that I can behold your way, your word, your work. Number one, the revelation of God's way. In Exodus chapter 33, Exodus 33, reading there in verse 13, it says, Now therefore, I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way. But you know, when I read the Bible and I read about these men, I'm so, I'm so impressed about them. See, look up here. This is Moses. At, at the beginning of Exodus, that's right in chapter 3 there, he beheld the power, the presence, the majesty of God in the burning bush that was not consumed. That was not enough. In chapter 4, the Lord spoke to him and put the word in your mouth. In chapter 5, he came to Pharaoh. He came to the people of Israel. In chapter 6, he, the Lord revealed himself as the great I am that I am. In chapter 7, all through miracles, miracles, miracles. And then, as we get to chapters 19 and 20, it went right up to the mountain. 40 days. And the Lord revealed unto him his law. And then all through to chapter 32, he just saw the glory of God and the majesty of God and the greatness of God. Look at him here, saying, God, show me now your way. You know why many people don't make spiritual progress? The reason is, because of the experience they had in chapter 3, in chapter 4. Because of the mighty miracles that were done through them. All from chapter 8, all through to chapter 13, 14. It wasn't it through him that the Red Sea was divided and parted and the people passed over? What else am I looking for? You see, not through this man just lifting up his hand that's exodus chapter 17 and the, the war the battle was won what else am i looking for is it not to this man striking the rock water came out what else am i looking for but here is this man i've seen a lot i've known a lot i've experienced a lot here i come today show me your way 
and that's the attitude we ought to have you know the reason why people do not make spiritual progress and they're just stagnant and they're just there marking time and they never see anything new again they don't see anything new again there, there is no refreshing thought there is no refreshing renewal in their heart in their soul in their mind in their spirit in their lives the reason why quiet time has no meaning they just read that uh, the bible quiet time quiet time and they read they don't get anything they don't know anything and there's no improvement in their lives because they don't expect to see anything new and as we come to the conference here yeah, there are people that don't expect to see any as it was so it is and so shall it ever be and they are not praying a new prayer show me thy way the revelation of God's way. When we say God's way, what's that? The way of truth and the way of holiness. Show it to me. That, that's the prayer. He was praying in First Samuel, for Samuel, chapter 12. For Samuel, chapter 12, reading there in verse 23. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. If someone knew that the revelation of God's way, that's the key to pleasing God. That's the key to serving God. That's the key to fulfilling the will of God, the plan of God for your life. And he said, as for me, I'll not stop praying for you. Well, do you understand this now? The children of Israel at this time, they wanted their way. You know, they wanted a king to rule over them. They didn't want to follow Samuel anymore. This, this, this man whose mother was barren. And she prayed. We know all the history about him. Who was living with Eli? This man. We don't, we don't know about his two children. This man. We don't want him to lead us again. Give us a king that will go before us and lead us like any of the other nations. And, and God said, Give it to them. But tell them the manner. And the character of that king. Eventually, after they had their way, they saw that their way will destroy them. They came now to Samuel. And Samuel said, you know what? The way to correct everything that has gone wrong. And the way to come in the right path. We ought to go is for you to now open your ears, open your heart. And I will teach you the good and the right way is by the teaching that the revelation comes and as you come over here during this week that's why we're here just to reveal to you to teach you and to instruct you the right the good way second chronicles chapter 6 verse 27 second chronicles 6 27 then hear thou from heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people israel when thou hast taught them the good way when you have taught them a solomon was praying to almighty god forgive their sin and then when they come to you and you have taught them the good way is a teaching of the word of god that brings us to that good way and uh, as you come here we you didn't come so that you know you just come in here get the program register eat talk pray a little sing a little and then go back home and then at the end when we finish on saturday we ask you what did you actually get you say get well I got Jesus only, I so message Jesus only. <laughs> Jesus only, no, we see. Savior, sanctifier, healer, baptizer, and coming king. Didn't you know that song before? I, we, we, I enjoyed that song. That's all you got? 
God bless you. You know, there are some people, they don't get anything. Nothing new. But when you open your heart, when you open your life, and the Lord puts in something there, his word, his way, and say, praise the Lord, things are clearer now. I came here in confusion, not knowing the right way, not knowing the way to go, not knowing what I will do. No, I was even almost discouraged this way, teaching these young people, getting involved in this, but now when I came over here and the Lord revealed to me, this is the right way to do it. I'm going back now. I have the tool in my hand and I'm going to do something for the Lord. That's what it takes in Psalm 25 verse 9. Psalm 25 verse 9. The meek will he guide in judgment. The meek will he teach his way. You can be in this church 10 years, 20 years, and not know the way of God. God's way. Why? If you are not meek. If you are not submissive. If you are not humble. If you are lowly. If you are not lowly. If you are not meek, the meek will he teach his way. And that's why everybody comes and then when we finish on the last day, Saturday, you find people on the road there, they are coming for the conference, and you find some argument and some fighting and some, you say, what? These people are just coming out of the conference, see how they are behaving. Yes, because they were not meek while they were here to receive the impress and impression and the image, the superscription of the nature of God in them. But the meek, this one saying, Lord, I am nothing. I know nothing. They are humble. Lord, what could I have? What could I know? What could I see without you? They are meek. They are humble. Lord, I don't know anything. I just went to school. They just taught me alphabets and words and letters. And the letter, you know, the professors can read this and not understand. I know nothing. Teach me. Is that humility and meekness and lowliness that will help you to prepare your mind and prepare your heart for the way of God? That's why it says, the meek will he teach his way. And then, of course, you have to choose it yourself because you have a choice to make. Psalm 119 verse 30. 119 verse 30. I have chosen the way of truth. And the Lord will not force you. He never forced the people of Israel. He just, he just told them, I put before you life and death. Choose life that you may live. But you couldn't force them. And the prophets that were sent to Israel, great, good prophets. Isaiah. Could he force the children of Israel? No. Nobody can force anyone to choose this good way. It's in your hand. And your choice will determine your destiny. This man said, I, this is my choice. I have chosen. You might be there. Coming to the conference doesn't mean that you're going to see God's way, the good way. The right way, the righteous way, the way of holiness doesn't mean that. You need to make a choice. And if you are there and you are full of pride, you are full of arrogance, and you are full of self-will, and you are hardened in stubbornness, and you are not meek, and you don't say, Lord, who am I? What do I know? What do I have? Where could I be without you? It's when you have that attitude. And you say, Lord, I'm going to make a choice now. Voluntarily. Without anybody forcing me. Voluntarily. With my will. With my volition. I choose the way 
of truth. That means the way of error will be there. Before you can make a choice, you are at a crossroad. The way of false doctrine will be there. There is a spirit of truth, there's a spirit of error. And when you see error here, truth here, and then you say, yes, I know, I know. I, I know the difference between the two. I personally, I choose the way of truth. And that's why Jeremiah told the people, because they had a choice to make. Just like you have a choice to make. Look at this. In Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, thus says the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? Be checking out. Find out. Stand. See. Ask. Where is the good way? And then, when you have found it, walk therein. You have a choice to make, and it's your choice. Jeremiah didn't choose for them. What are we talking about? Even Jesus couldn't choose for them. Judas Iscariot was there and heard everything he preached. And he saw all the miracles they did. Can you imagine Judas Iscariot? And also a significant officer there. Every offering that came, every amount of money that came, went through his hand. He was there when Lazarus, who had been dead for four days, thinking. When Jesus looked up to heaven and he said, Father... I know that you hear me always, but for the sake of those who are here, I speak these words. And then he looked down to the grave, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth. Judas Iscariot was there. And yet, that man never chose the good way. You know what I'm telling you? You can see the greatest miracles. You can see, you can hear the greatest doctrines, teachings, and you can be taught by the greatest of preachers. And yet, if you do not make your personal choice, you will never discover God's way. And that's why I'm talking to you and telling you that you will pray that prayer. Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. That you will discover God's way. Because without it, your coming here will be in vain. In Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2. That's what we are talking about now. Just being excited about the possibility of Almighty God Himself teaching you His own way. In Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways. Many people will rally together, rally around, talk to one another, counsel one another, challenge one another. Hold one another. Come on. Come up. Let's go to the house of the Lord. For one reason. For one purpose. So that he will teach us his ways. Come into the mount of transfiguration. Come in. To this place where God's name is honored. Where the word of God is preached. You need to have a purpose in your mind. Even before you came. Let us go up. To the house of the Lord. To the mountain of the Lord. That he and he will teach us his ways. But when he does. Because the Lord is not in the habit of wasting 
his peers. Cast not your peers before dogs. Cast not the precious thing before swine. Lest they trample over them and turn around and bite you. So the Lord is not in the business and the habit of just throwing precious things to the people that will not appreciate those precious things. That's why these people said, we're even going to promise him before we get there, that we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the Lord and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Number one then is the revelation of God's way. Number two, righteousness through God's word. Righteousness through God's word. And this also comes through his revelation. If the Lord does not reveal his righteousness to you, I'm telling you, it, no matter how much you try, how hard you try, you'll never discover God's righteousness. It's only as he reveals to you in answer to your prayer. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things. And what are the wondrous things? One of them is the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1. Verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. You see that? Show it to me. Give it to me. Therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written. The just shall live by faith. When you understand that it's important, indispensable, that you have the righteousness of God. And you cannot have it by yourself. And that righteousness comes through God's word. Uh, not just the written word, there's a living word, there's a written word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and that Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of glory, and of His fullness have we all received. It is that Word, the living Word, but then the written Word, all Scripture is given by inspiration. And it is profitable for correction, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. On one hand, the living word. On the other hand, the written word. When God reveals Christ to you, the living word. And it is through that living word, through that Christ, that you receive this righteousness and of course through the instruction of god's word the written word uh, look at it in um, second timothy chapter 3 verses 16 and 17 all scripture is given by inspiration of god and it's profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction and that is why we're given the word of god and, um, let me tell you once again when nobody can force doctrine on you you have to make your choice nobody can force correction on you you have to make your choice nobody can force righteousness on you you have to make your choice nobody can a false holiness on you you have to make your choice i may talk of holiness uh, from now till uh, the day of the death of methuselah 
And there will be people there that will never appreciate, that will never receive, that will never get that holiness because nobody can force it on you. But when you make your choice, because the living word Christ has influenced you, and the reaching word, the Holy Bible, is a precious thing to you. That's when you make the choice that the correction of the word, the instruction of the word, will influence you. And then you will live that life that is pleasing unto the Lord. It says it's profitable. Profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man of God may be perfect, complete, mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All, not just some, all good works. But that righteousness comes through the word of God. In Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter 6. Verse 8. Micah is in the Old Testament. You know where Daniel is. After that, you know where Osea is. And then Joel, Amos. Just keep on opening. You come to Micah. Micah chapter 6 verse 8 He has showed thee O man what is good and what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. That's what he's showing us. O man, O woman, Christian leader, youth minister, he's showing you what the Lord demands, requires from you. And it's righteousness. And he shows us that in his word. And he says, it's to do justly. No injustice. No insincerity. No hypocrisy. No pretense. No fraud. No deception. Nothing wicked. Nothing that you don't want. Others, nothing immoral. Nothing that you condemn in others and you are doing. To walk justly. Righteousness revealed unto us through God's word. And it's one of the wondrous things out of thy law. And then it says, and to love mercy. Not just to love it to receive, but to love it to give it out. Uh, to, to be merciful, to be tender, to be gentle, to, to be loving, to be considerate. That as we are here together and as we go back home, as you live your life, to love mercy. That your thought, which produces your action which leads to your habit which eventually formulates your destiny that starting from your thought to your action to your habit your destiny that you love mercy that the thought of your heart will be thoughts that are caring and loving and merciful and gentle and considerate of your neighbor to love, mercy, righteousness. That's what we're talking about. And to walk. And to walk. What's the next word? Humbly. Not like Jezebel. To walk humbly. Not like Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Their leader, Moses, said, Call those men for me. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, come over here. Go back and tell him, We will not come. To walk 
humbly with thy God. Not to walk like Absalom, craftily, to walk humbly with thy God. Not to walk like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, to walk humbly with thy God. Not to walk like the people that are just looking for bread and butter. And when Jesus told them, you seek me, because you etch those loaves and you are and you are filled. You seek me because you are expecting healing, deliverance, material things, bread and butter, money, progress, success, but labor not for the things which perish, but labor for the things that endure unto life eternal. When they had that. Many of them walked no more with him, and they went away, and they remained twelve. And Jesus turned to the twelve and said, Will you also go away? Because he's not interested in people that are walking after him, running after him, following after him for material things, ulterior motive, private agenda. And then Peter replied and said, To whom shall we go? You have the word of eternal life. And it is that word that will produce faith. It is that faith that will generate the righteousness in us. Righteousness through God's word. You have the word of eternal life. And then Jesus said, Have I not chosen you twelve? But I'm sorry, one of you is a devil. To walk humbly with thy God. And that's what the Lord is expecting from everyone. In Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, open my eyes that I may see. And if you want to see, uh, the greatest that you can see is God himself. And how can you see God? Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed, blessed, happy, joyful, blessed, eternally. And those that are pure in heart, when the word of God, they are clean through the word that has spoken unto them. Wash them, washing them by the water of the word. That he may bring unto himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blame. When this water of the word of God washes your heart, washes your spirit, washes your soul, washes you within, washes you without, and affects your thought, affects your life, affects your action, affects your dressing, affects your language, affects everything pure through and through. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Show me a man that is passionately seeking after, running after, praying for purity of heart. And he's over here in a conference, and he's not worried about what the other people say, what the other people do, how the other people act. Show me a man, show me a woman that says, Lord, I came over here and I want to see you in the end. And I know before I can see you in the end, I must be pure in my heart. Out of the heart proceeds forth every all the issues of life. And so it means if your heart is pure, what comes forth? What rushes out? What comes out of your heart to your mouth to your action will be pure. And then it says, blessed are those pure in heart. Those that are pure in heart. Because only they shall see God. And that's the reason you're asking God, Lord, help me. I want to see you on the final day. And I want to see you even now. Uh, every crossroad in my life. Every difficulty in my life. Every problem I, I pass through. I want to see you there with me. I don't want to see the devil. But blessed are the pure in heart. The pure in heart. Those are the people that will see the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 33. Isaiah. Chapter 
chapter 33, verse 15. He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he that despises the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hand from holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood, and shorteth his eyes from seeing evil, he shall dwell on high. Amen. His place of defense shall be the munitions of the rocks. Bread shall be given him. His waters shall be sure. Then it says, this is the result now. Uh, when you allow the word of God, the word of God to so work in you, purify you, purge you, cleanse you, make you righteous, make you holy, make you pure. Then eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off. If it's your intention that at the close of day, when you walk the last mile of the way, if it's your intention, because it will come the last mile of the way. The last day of your life. It will come if it's your intention, your passion, your desire that you want to see the king in his beauty. You see it in verse 15. You will walk righteously. It will not be your intention just to come for program and just to go through the program. You'll want to have the grace, the power, the strength, the divine nature imparted unto you to walk righteously and to speak uprightly, coloring, exaggerating, lying. Deceiving, modifying, mutilating, do whatever, watch your mouth. And every day, and every part of the day, you're always exaggerating, always exaggerating, always exaggerating, telling lies. If you want to sing the king in his beauty on a final day, you speak uprightly. And then it says, he despises the gain of oppression. Anything you will gain with a wrong method, you'll despise it. You say, no, no. Even, what's, what's, what's it good for me if I gain the whole world? If I have my way? If I gain and I get what I want, but I get it in a wrong way? Through oppression, through lying, through deceit, through bribery, through corruption. Through cheating, once again, you will not see the, the king in his beauty on the final day. But he shakes his hand from holding bribe. If that's bribe, please take it away. I prefer to die of hunger. I prefer to do without and to be in need rather than taking bribe that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood and shortest his eyes from seeing evil in the television industry and any media personnel will tell you this they have to include crime so as to retain the attention of the viewers. They have to show the shooting, the crime, the evil, evil things, and to keep you in suspense, to retain your action, and they have to show those bad, bad things. 
And it says, if you are going to see the king in his beauty on that final day, you will stop your ears from hearing of blood. You know, there are some people that say it's a deeper life that doesn't allow them to watch television. I pity you. You don't have any conviction. You don't know where you stand. And it says, shut his eyes from seeing evil. That's what you see every day on television. And the internet that has now come in, a great tool. Great tool. Electronic. But, there's a lot of evil there as well. And there are many, not only young people, there are many, many people that go to browse in the, over the internet. All they want to see, they want to see evil. And of course, you know that you can hear. Even if you know the CD, you know the computer, you can see and hear today. And there are many, many people, you do it in secret. Ah... Your religion is the religion of when the pastor is there. Your religion is the religion of when the Christian leader is there. Your religion is the religion when your wife is there. Your religion is the religion of when your husband is there. When your husband is not there, when your wife is not there, when your pastor is not there, when your Christian leader is not there, God is there. Your short, your eyes from seeing evil, and you stop your ears from hearing of blood. Then it tells us that those are the people your eyes will see the king in his beauty. And you will behold the land that is afar. I pray God will help you. So that on that final day, Coming to conference will not be in vain. And on that final day, and that's the day that counts. That's the day that counts. That's the day that counts. The D day. The day of reward. The day of recompense. When you'll be able to see the Almighty God. Number one, the revelation of God's way. Number two, righteousness through God's word. Number three, release to God's work. Release. To God's work. When you come in here and you're asking the Lord what you what He wants you to do, and you're willing that He will release you and you will release yourself to the work He has given you to do, then you'll be able to hear Him and you'll be able to see Him. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, verses 15 and 16. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is the chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake i will show him you know what we're talking about open my eyes when god opens your eyes he will show you the work you will do for him it will not be that well they made announcement and you know they were pleading with everybody come on yield yourself give your time please 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 get involved so i just pity those people because they were getting frustrated they didn't have enough workers that's why i just joined do not be like that go thy way he is a chosen vessel and when the lord sees your heart that you really want to serve him and you're totally committed unto him and he lays his hand on you and you are not telling the lord i will do it if it's this if it's not this 
I'll do it if the conditions are okay for me. I will do it if you will allow me to also do this other thing. I will do it if you will change the conditions so that I will not have to sacrifice and suffer too much. When you give everything to the Lord and say, Lord, I want to serve you. I want to walk you. And if you are calling me to this youth ministry, children's ministry, I will do it. Then he lays his hands on you. And he says, you are a chosen vessel to declare his name to the Gentiles that do not know the Lord and to the kings, the people that are up there. And then it says to the children of Israel, to the people that are religious. And then it says, I will show him the things he must suffer. Are there suffering connected with the work of the Lord? Who wants to, who is promising anyone? Who is promising you? Come and walk with us. Then there will be no difficulties anymore. There will be no problems anymore. Everything will be all right. That's deception. That's deception. You're going to work for God. You want to work among the youth. No, we don't want to deceive you. Stop. Sweat and tears. Difficulties. Rough road. Moses is suffered. David, I'm telling you, he suffered. Daniel, you know it, he suffered. And Jesus Christ, in bringing us to salvation, he suffered. Paul, uh -uh, you know the story, he suffered. Peter and John, they suffered. And everyone that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And they went to Iconium and to Antioch. And they gathered the people and encouraged them and strengthened them. Telling them that through much tribulation we shall inherit the kingdom of God. The suffering. But Jesus has left us an example in that he suffered for us. And then we shall follow after his steps. We'll suffer. If somebody is coming to you and is saying, you know, if you become a worker in our area, in our place, you know, there will be no suffering, but it has deception. Then it means that it is not the work of God. If it is the work of God, I will show him the great things, not just little moderate things, the great things he must suffer for my name's sake. The Lord will reveal it to you. When he reveals it to you, you want to serve the Lord and you are praying, open my eyes that I may see. Then he will reveal to you and release you to God's work. In uh, chapter 13 of Acts, Acts chapter 13, verse 2, As the minister to the Lord and Father, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. When you are praying to the Lord, and you mean you mean the prayer, not that kind of prayer that you know you are praying and you are even congratulating yourself. Praise the Lord, see me today. I prayed. It, it look, let me look at the time. I prayed for ten minutes. Praise the Lord, see me today. Great, not that kind of prayer. I'm thinking. I'm talking about the kind of prayer that you abandon yourself. I'm talking about a kind of prayer you forget yourself. I'm talking about a kind of prayer that you yield yourself. I'm talking about a prayer, a kind of prayer that you are just saying, Oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord, reveal yourself to me. What you want me to do and empower me, energize me, help me, fire me up. Let there be passion and desire. Everything you want me to do, don't, don't even let me see. Don't let me think about. Don't let me even feel the suffering that comes as a result of the work. I yield myself. I surrender myself. Whatever it will take. Here I am, use me. That's the kind of prayer we're talking about. It's not a kind of prayer that, you know, you're praying like just little, little toddlers, little, little children, opening your eyes and closing your eyes and looking around and, you know, thinking that, you know, I might not pray too much. When the Lord himself take hold, takes hold of you and you say, Lord, I want you to use me. I hope that's why you are here. I said, I hope that's why you are here. You want God to use you. You want God to use you. That 
if it's in the youth ministry, the youth in your community, the youth beyond your community, everywhere that we just say, Lord, all I'm looking for as I come here, you will open my eyes to see days of opportunity so that I'll be able to minister in self-forgetfulness. Self-forgetfulness. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. Verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. If there is a King Uzziah in your life, that always gets your attention. If there's a King Uzziah in your life, that's very, very important and central in your life, any decision you want to take, you must consult King Uzziah first. Anything you are planning to do, you must say, what will King Uzziah think about this? Before you take that decision, if there's a King Uzziah in your life, and uh, you, you are wondering, if I am going to release myself to the work of God, what's King Uzziah going to say? The Lord is not going to talk to you. It was in the year that King Uzziah died, he got out of the way, he is forgotten and buried, that I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his strength filled the temple and it stood, and the seraphim above it stood, and each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. Six wings. And it says, with two of the wings he covered his face. I'm ashamed before God. I cover my face. I don't want familiarity to lead to contempt. Too much familiarity with God. Too much familiarity with the word of God. Too much familiarity with the leadership in the church. I cover my face. I don't want to become so familiar. Look. And belittle what I see. So, with twain, with two of the wings, they cover their faces. And with twain, they cover their feet. Watch in the house of God that you are not so swift, you are not so fast, you control your feet. Because this is holy ground. And then, with twain, he did fly fast. When the call comes, when the errand is given, those angels, they preserved those two wings to be able to fly swiftly and get to the place they ought to go. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And they knew the, the holiness of God. And those angels, they cried one to another. Holy? Holy, holy. When you become conscious of the holiness of God, when you become conscious that everything related to God through and through, infinitely, is holiness. And there is that angelic utterance coming out of the depth of your heart. And it's not a mechanical thing. It's not a mechanical thing. The Spirit of God grabs you, takes hold of you, and from your innermost being, you cry out, Holy, holy, holy. You run after it. You pursue it. You are passionate about it. Then, he said, the whole earth is full of your glory. No glory without holiness, brothers and sisters. It's when you understand that heaven is full of the holiness of God. And then your language, your thought, your mind is full of the holiness of God. And your thought and your passion and your cry is full of the holiness of God. It's then the earth will be full of his glory. I challenge you here. I know, I know. In this country and in West Africa and in Africa, many, many, many churches, many, many, many churches, many, many, many churches are rising up. But until, until in all those churches, there is the emphasis of holy, 
holy, holy. Nigeria will never be full of the glory of God. Africa will never be full of the glory of God. It starts with holiness. When you have holy, 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 the next thing, the conclusion, the corollary, the thing that will follow will be that the earth will be full of the glory of God and the posts of the doors moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, this is a prophet, by the way. This is a preacher, by the way. When he saw the glory of God, when he saw the brightness of the majesty of God, then I cried and I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean leaves, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean leaves, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he has taken with the tongues from up the the altar and he laid it upon my mouth and he said lo this has touched thy leaves then iniquity is taken away and that and i see this point today I, i'm not here for just you know a mechanical kind of conference i'm not here to just talk as i spoke before i'm not here to preach as i preached before i'm here so that i can get the people if they are there in any of the halls one to seven eight eight to ten that are saying i want the life goal the fire from the altar of god to come upon my leaves to come upon my heart and take all my iniquity away it's after that when that had been done iniquity poured sin taken away totally purified holy he became a useful instrument in the hand of the lord also i heard the voice of the lord saying whom shall i send who will go for us then said i read the rest read it out loud here am I, send me, who will go for you, Lord? Who will go for you, Lord? Here am I, here am I, send me, send me. If you are telling the Lord, if you love this country, if you love the young people of this country, if you love the young people in this continent, and you are saying, I know, I know, the only thing is a man, an Isaiah that is set on fire, an Isaiah that is purged, an Isaiah that has seen the glory of God, an Isaiah that has seen the holiness of God, an Isaiah that has had the angel coming and touching his leaves and touching his or the life call from the altar he takes such an Isaiah he takes such a man he takes such a woman a man that is set on fire a man that is crying for holiness a man that says I'm undone a man that says I'm not sanctified I'm not holy I'm not pure all the, the only thing I'm looking for I want holiness I want purity I want my heart to be set on the fire of the altar of God those are the only people that the Lord is going to use in this old time, end time harvest and then they will be able to say here am i here am i here am i here am i send me if you want the lord to send you and to use you you'll be calling upon the lord and you will tell him sanctify me you will tell him purify me you will tell him make me holy and you will allow the fire coming from the altar of the lord to come upon your soul come upon your mind come upon your heart come upon your lips and everything your utterance will be holy your life will be holy. Your character will be holy. Your mind will be Everything will be holy. The Lord is calling. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Here am I, Lord. 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 Send me.